Thank you, honorable members. Before we proceed, I would like to remind you that the virtual mini plenary is deemed to be in the precincts of parliament and constitutes a meeting of the National Assembly for debating purposes only. In addition to the rules of virtual sittings, the rules of the National Assembly, including all the rules of debate apply. Members enjoy the same powers and privilege that apply in the sitting of the National Assembly. Members should equally note that anything that is said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been said to the House and may be ruled upon. All members who have locked in shall be considered present and are requested to mute their microphones and only unmute it when requested to speak. The microphones are very sensitive and will pick up noise, which might disturb other members. And when recognized to speak, please unmute your microphone and connect your video. Members may make use of the icons on the bar at the bottom of the screens, which have an option that allows a member to put up his or her hand to raise a point of order. The Secretariat will assist me in this regard. When using the virtual system, members are urged to refrain or resist from unnecessary points of order or interjections. We shall now proceed to the order, which is debate on vote number 39, trade, industry, and competition appropriation bill. I now recognize the Honorable Minister of Trade, Industry, and Competition. The Honorable Minister. House Chairperson, Honorable Members, Fellow South Africans, good morning. Last year, I addressed this House and set out five areas of focus namely the pursuit of a more inclusive model of growth, greater local production, an increase in trade, stronger investment, and green industrialization. We have made progress on these fronts, despite the strong global headwinds that are affecting uh, economies everywhere. What I have seen is the practical embodiment of the resilience that I spoke of in my 2020 budget vote speech. Over the last 12 months, South Africans have set about quietly and with purpose, rolling up their sleeves and getting the job done. I have seen displays of this determination and resilience across the country, firms and entrepreneurs bouncing back in the wake of adversity. The South African economy began to recover from the first wave of COVID-19, growing at 4.9% last year. Manufacturing exports were the highest in at least a decade. The agriculture and auto value chains had the best export performance yet. Africa opened its first anesthetic production facility in the same year that pharmaceutical exports reached record levels. But despite our collective efforts and our progress, the economy and ordinary South Africans still face many great challenges, some of which are persistent and enduring, some of which are new. Our response to these challenges must grow the number of jobs more, expand the industrial base, and confront poverty and inequality. Today, I want to speak about the risks that we face and my department's strategic intent to contribute to de-risking our economy so to protect the livelihoods of all South Africans to build forward better. Since the last budget vote a year ago, we faced three new shocks or headwinds that impact on the economy and our well-being. Firstly, the July 2021 unrest in KZN and parts of Gauteng that led to loss of life and the destruction of infrastructure, dented business confidence and disrupted supply chains. Secondly, the war in Ukraine that has already resulted in fuel price increases and rising costs of fertilizer, wheat, edible oils and other foodstuffs. Thirdly, the recent floods on our eastern seaboard that have led to loss of life and washed away homes, shops, factory assets, and railway lines, and reminded us of the cost of climate change. Honorable members, shocks, however hard they hit us, are often the prelude to new insights in societies. Disruption can inspire innovation. The damage caused by the July unrest last year in some districts required a more agile and responsive state as firms saw their factories, machinery, and even their financial records go up in smoke. DTIC entities changed their way of working, and within three days of the onset of the unrest, the DTIC had established a 24-hour hotline to support companies, 
threatened by the unrest. Within a week, engagements had begun to help companies rebuild, and within two weeks, officials were on the ground to survey the damage and help firms get back on their feet. We must all learn from the misfortunes that we encounter and adapt and find ways to de-risk for the future. There are three standout lessons from the new shocks of the past year, honorable members, which reinforce what we have learned from the systemic shocks of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. One lesson is that economies and supply chains are vulnerable and that building greater industrial resilience need even greater prominence in policymaking. The other lesson is that societies need a capable and a responsive state uh, that is agile and equipped to quickly marshal what is needed when risks materialize. Above all, we have to grasp the lesson that the absence of economic justice places the burdens of climate, social, and geopolitical disruptions on those in society that can least afford to shoulder these burdens. These shocks are disturbing permanently the old ways of doing things. Business as usual is no longer an option for the private sector, for governments, for development agencies, for all of us. We must innovate and adapt to this new normal, an often volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and fractured world. De-risking and diversifying supply chains is becoming a business imperative for domestic and multinational corporations. Policymakers are taking more a time to talk about regionalization of supply chains to address geopolitical risk and the new fault lines developing in the global economy. I have heard from more global CEOs and business leaders raising with me the matter of risk-proofing their own source locations. There's both danger and opportunity in the new landscape. The question is, how will we as South Africans respond? Can we de-risk so that we reduce our exposure to the downside and increase our exposure to the upside of a world that is rapidly changing? At home, we can remain trapped by our petty fights, focus only on the short term, wrapped in got you politics, and fighting selfishly over a small cake, a zero-sum race to the bottom. Or we can look up and beyond and see how the world is changing, which will allow us to shift drastically and build a real consensus on the hard choices, and with discipline and focus, grow the economy inclusively so that it can create jobs and opportunities for young people in a way that shares rather than concentrates wealth. We remain over-dependent on off offshore sourcing for our own economy and on a few products, mainly commodities, to drive our growth, leaving us as price takers and with our economic performance over-dependent on what happens in global commodity markets. This means that we risk losing out on the greater opportunity that this new wave of diversification and regionalization can bring. South Africa can play a more prominent role in this world of regional production hubs, but we can do so only if we step up our focus on improving the dynamism and capacity of our industrial base and create opportunities for firms in our markets to grow by intensifying industrialization, by spearheading transformation to build an inclusive economy, and by building a capable state to execute our strategy. We set out in the annual plan of the department about 150 specific actions and indicators, and it's published on the DTIC website. Our pursuit of industrialization seeks to expand the level of local output, both to secure part of the local market loss to imports and to boost value-added exports. Our efforts in this regard are focused on strategic industries, as defined by the capacity to be labor-absorbing, we need jobs, or providers of critical public goods, we need healthcare, or significant earners of foreign exchange. The initiatives, be it in the area of encouraging localization of production, social compacts in the form of master plans, strong industrial supply chains to underpin our response to COVID-19 and create an African medical production hub, or our work on the African continental free trade area, have all sought to provide local industry with a space and the opportunity to acquire the know-how and the capabilities to develop dynamic firms. Our work on spearheading transformation 
seeks to create opportunities for all South Africans. This involves deconcentrating our economy, opening up exclusive uh, product and service markets to participation by all. It is also about our enduring commitment to support the black industrialists and workers who were previously denied access to the opportunities for economic ownership and participation. Furthermore, honorable members, it's also about ensuring that the spatial strategy that informs how we build and support a new model of special economic zones and industrial parks in secondary downs in, uh, towns and core hubs is informed by the principle of trying to expand industrial activity beyond its concentration in the urban metropolitan areas. Transformation is about building an economy that works where our people are, bringing development to rural provinces and districts. Our revised approach to spatial industrial policy informed by the district development model will see the DTIC supporting projects that create jobs, infrastructure, and innovation in districts across the country. The capable state is about administrative capability and, efficient, and efficiency, but it's more than that. It's about working in partnership with business and labor, aligning our work with other parts of the state, such as with our counterparts, overseeing the energy logistics and security related uh, aspects of our work, and building a social compact brick by brick, partnership by partnership, within and across the state, and even more importantly, across our society. This integrated vision of industrialization and transformation is only as strong as our capability to turn them into reality. So to execute the strategy, we will address our weaknesses, but we will also build on our successes. There has been progress in a number of areas from new production lines in our auto, food and healthcare sectors, progress with beneficiation, the sugar and clothing master plans, new investment projects and jobs created, small businesses supported and action against corruption. A new focus on inclusive growth saw about 100,000 additional workers securing shares in their firms in the past year through competition settlements with ShopRite, Burger King, and Imperial Logistics, bringing the recorded worker shareholding in the economy to over 400,000 to date. I will not detail the many other positive stories this morning. Uh, Deputy Minister Gina you know, will do some of them, but we'll also release a short summary of some of the key achievements in the past year. I want to highlight instead the details of our plans for the year ahead, which turned the de-risking strategy that I've outlined to this house today into reality. To fuel the economic recovery and deepen industrialization, the DTIC entities together will offer 22 billion Rand in customized support packages to companies over the next 12 months. This will be complemented by strategic support to deepen implementation of our master plans, including the launch of the new 400 million Rand Furniture Growth Fund in partnership with manufacturers and retailers. To support our localization efforts, we will aim to achieve a 40 billion Rand increase in the production of targeted local industrial output, which brings us closer to our, our five-year target of 200 billion Rand. Our investment facilitation and promotion activities will aim to unlock at least 120 billion Rand in investment from the private sector in the next 12 months. Last year, I outlined the first steps we will take to embrace the opportunities in green industrialization through the green hydrogen and electric vehicle roadmaps. We have made considerable progress in researching practical options, costing them, identifying possible funding, publishing a draft green paper, and receiving feedback from stakeholders. We will now table our draft green hydrogen commercialization strategy in cabinet for consideration and guidance by the end of August and our electric vehicles roadmap by the end of October. In a rapidly evolving and disrupt, uh, disrupted global trade environment, honorable members, the department's officials, uh, the officials from uh, entities will work hard to secure at least 600 billion Rand in manufacturing exports with a package of support to grow and diversify South African exports, 
and to secure our trading future on the African continent. We hope we can do more, but let's aim for no less than that. The Competition Commission is conducting a market inquiry into online services like e-commerce, tourism, accommodation, food, and other online delivery platforms to be completed during this year. And it will also launch a new inquiry into fresh produce markets, which I hope will bring insights and relief to consumers faced with high and rising food bills. Honorable members, we will commence the next phase of the AFC FTA negotiations by developing draft protocols on competition, intellectual property, and investment. Our work in these important areas will enable firms to manage the expansion into the rest of Africa, and we will also make available a multi-billion rand facility in risk cover to strategic exports through the Export Credit Insurance Corporation. This facility will complement our efforts to launch more export networks with entrepreneurs to share knowledge and coordinate government support among exporters. By the end of the year, we will have introduced a revised approach to spatial industrial policy with cross-cutting frameworks for special economic zones, industrial parks, and the interventions to enable and support the township economy and focus on industrial development in at least 25 districts across South Africa. Fellow South Africans, building an enabling environment for industrialization requires securing our key network infrastructures such as energy and logistics and protecting our electrical grid and rail network from the continued threat of scrap metal syndicates. By the end of July, we will have developed and tabled the draft policy on scrap metal, which will introduce a blend of domestic and export measures to address illegal trade in copper cable and scrap metal. Energy and logistics is vital to the success of our industrialization efforts. Minister Praveen Gordon and I have agreed to launch a forum to bring together ESCOM, Transnet and other entities, together with industrialists in key sectors, to enhance collaboration, advanced planning and problem solving. This will enable a better climate for investment and job creation. This is being jointly announced by my colleague who is also giving his budget vote right now. We must make it easier to do business. The Deputy Ministers and I have requested DTIC entities by December to have concrete measures to cut red tape, streamline their processes, and make them accessible and less onerous for entrepreneurs and citizens. This will align with the commitment that the President made on cutting red tape in the State of the Nation Address in February this year. Honorable Members, we will shift from red tape to smart regulation that helps those who want to build and protect the system against those who seek to abuse it at the expense of the poor and the vulnerable. This work will also include a process to consolidate the sprawl of entities within our ambit, creating a leaner and more responsive and relevant set of institutions. The point is that we must all learn from the past and adapt for the future. We must continue to show resilience as we build and de-risk our economy, which is essential to our vision of a truly non-racial democratic society. Over the next 12 months, we can expect a number of concrete actions. This month has already started solidly with a VW plant in Tarija, Eastern Cape, producing the one millionth polo for export. We launched a new food factory, Kerry Ingredients in KZN. Corobrick opened its new production facility and a new black industrialist export network was launched. And by the end of the month, the IDC will have launched the pilot township economy program to improve access to finance and de-risks SMMEs through business support measures. By June, Consul will have opened its new, class, uh, its new glass container production plant in Ikuruleni with an investment value of 1.5 billion rand. A new steel manufacturing facility plans to open in Tabanchu in Free State. The Japan South Africa Business Forum will be launched. The first disbursements will take place from the IDC's new social employment uh, fund. And trade ministers will meet at the WTO to, to address key trade policy matters. By July, a new call center, Sigma International, will open its doors and offer jobs to young people from Mitchell's Plain and Kayalicha. The Saudi Arabia South Africa Business Council will be finalized, and Cabinet will consider the nomination of South Africa to host the next AGOA Forum. 
by August, the new photovoltaic production plant, uh, production plant of Seraphim will open in East London, supported by IDC facilities. The Google new fiber optic submarine cable to improve South Africa's link with other African and European telecommunication hubs will have been launched. At least 55 deals will have been finalized under the JP Morgan Small Business Partnership with the DTIC. The first new capacity will come online for six black-owned poultry farms supported by the IDC, which will produce about 2 million birds per month, creating jobs in Northwest, Mpumalanga, Limpopo, and the Free State. And the company's amendment bill will be submitted to cabinet for consideration. By September, production of industrial helium will start in the Free State, one of only eight countries globally producing this gas. Uh, a company, Rail Industrial, will complete its tile manufacturing facility. A new South African food export network will be launched. We aim to conclude the Southern African Custom Union's formal tariff offer to the, AS the AFC FTA, covering 90% of all tariff lines. And the DTIC supporting film, The Woman King, will release worldwide. Filmed in Cape Town, it tells an African story of an all-female military unit in the 18th century West African Kingdom of Dahomey. By October, the Swani SEZ aims to complete 11 automotive component plants in support of Ford's 16 billion Rand investment, employing about 2,000 workers in the new zone. SA Steel Mills aim to complete its production plan announced at the investment conference and a draft patent bill will be submitted to cabinet for consideration. By November, BioVac will begin producing Pfizer vaccines in South Africa. The expansion of the SAPI cycle dissolving paper mill or pulp mill will be ready for an official opening. We will have commenced the next phase of AFC FTA negotiations with the draft protocols. And we will host an award ceremony for local production innovation, showcasing the successes we're starting to achieve. By December, the PF Nonwoven's new textile production line will have been open in Atlantis. We will host a conference of black exporters to help identify new markets and new opportunities. By January next year, we expect the completion of a new clothing manufacturing facility and dye house in KZN with 1,500 new workers. A review of the Sugar Master Plan will have been done, and the new anti-corruption unit of the DTIC will be operational. By February, Orion Carbon Engineering aims to complete a pipeline and tank storage facility at the port of Nuha to supply black carbon to the auto industry. The first African-developed mRNA vaccine will start clinical trials, and our efforts to cut red tape will be boosted by new draft regulations to deal with trade tariff investigations and safeguard measures. By March, DeFi will have completed its white good manufacturing investment facility in Ezakeni, valued at more than 300 million Rand. The, uh, the DTIC will have an industrial profile report for all 52 districts in South Africa, and a report on women and industrial funding will be completed. We will also complete a draft anti-alcohol abuse policy based on discussion with different departments of government. By April, 200 black women and youth businesses and persons will have been assisted with export training and support uh, and the IDC funded local technology will be used in a platinum mine in Northwest to make its smelting process greener and more efficient. And by May next year, which is just after the fifth anniversary of President Ramaphosa's announcement of the investment target, we intend to have met uh, or exceeded the 1.2 trillion rand commitment that the president uh, sought uh, us to secure. And Formex will have completed the automotive stamping press plant in the Eastern Cape. Honorable members, many wise words have been spoken about that quiet persistence in getting on with the job, such as Madiba's advice. Don't judge me, he said, by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. 
all that beautiful poetess, Maya Angelou, who reminded us that, and I quote, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it, unquote. In this context, honorable members, hard work matters, kindness and decency matters, optimism about the future matters. And so to rephrase the advice of the ages, it is our response to the shocks we face, not the shocks themselves that define us and determine how our nation will develop. I want in conclusion, honorable members, to thank Deputy Minister Majola and Deputy Minister Gina for the sterling work that they have undertaken and the team of staff led by acting DGs Malebo Mabichi Thompson and Shabir Khan for the invaluable contributions to the board and the leadership of the DTIC agencies. Thank you. And to our social partners for the work done this past year. It is my pleasure, therefore, to table the budget of the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition today before the National Assembly. Thank you, House Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Minister. The next speaker is the Honourable Herman. Honourable House Chair, Honourable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honourable Members and Fellow South Africans. The ANC supports the Budget Vote 39. The Portfolio Committee on Trade, Industry and Competition engaged the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and its entities on its allocated financial resources and how it will be utilized in the 2022-23 financial year. This budget allocation of 10.9 billion rand allows the DTIC and its entities to carry out their mandate. The allocated budget is in support of operations of the department, incentives and transfers to its entities. The DTIC sets out to focus on three outcomes, namely industrialization to promote jobs and rising incomes, transformation to build an inclusive economy, and a capable state to ensure the improved impact of public policies. The committee welcomed the government's strengthened three-pronged approach above to address the challenges facing the economy. However, the committee recognized that greater cooperation amongst all spheres of government is essential to achieve these desired outcomes. In its oversight over the DTIC and its entities allocated budgets and performance plans, the committee will continue to oversee the, the mandate of promoting structural economic transformation that will ensure economic growth and increased employment, implement programs that broaden participation of previously disadvantaged, particularly facilitating the creation of opportunities for Black people, women, and youth in economic activities, and developing, implementing, leg and implementing legislation to facilitate a predictable, competitive, equitable, and socially responsible environment conducive to investment trade and enterprise development. In its, in its engagement with the DTIC, the committee noted the reduction in the budget due to fiscal constraints, along with the reduction in funding that had been prioritized for COVID-19 relief interventions in the previous financial year. However, the committee was encouraged by increased coordination of work in the department and of its entities, which will assist in maximizing the available resources. In line with the current fiscal, fiscal constraints, the committee noted the DTIC's decision to review its uh, current industrial financing interventions for all sectors to maximize impact. It will oversee this during the financial year. The industrial financing program was of particular interest to the committee as it allocated the largest share of the department's budget, approximately 46% of the total budget. 
As the AMC, we welcome this as we believe that infrastructure spending remains a lever through which in the industrial development and economic growth can be sustained. Furthermore, through this program, the DTIC provides support to companies and leverages investment that facilitates the growth of the South African economy and creates jobs. The revival of the South African economy is critical for the creation of jobs and reducing inequality. Hence, the committee welcomed the various measures that the DTIC will finance through this budget, such as the sectoral master plans, localization and beneficiation, regional integration, and facilitating global trade, which it continued to use in aiding the implementation of the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. To date, six industry master plans, which include automotive, poultry, sugar, furniture, steel, and textile and clothing have been completed and implementation is at different phases. These master plans are critical in growing our industrial base and building the necessary resilience needed for our, eco for our economy in the face of global uncertainty. In the State of the Nation address delivered by President Ramaphosa in February this year, he emphasized the need to strengthen the facilitating of local localization. The committee is encouraged that the DTIC's second largest program, the Industrial Policy Program, which supports the development and impl implementation of policies that facilitate diversifying the manufacturing center, uh, sector and promoting local production has been allocated 1.7 billion rand in the financial year. Public procurement is one of the key policy instruments identified by the government for industrial development. Through public procurement, the government is able to utilize its significant purchasing power to stimulate economic development and transform the economy. In addition, the Industrial Development Corporation, which is an ent entity of the DTIC, through its funding vehicles will continue to support businesses that produce locally. In the 2022-23 financial year, the DTIC aims to facilitate localization worth 7.5 billion rand. The president also highlighted the creation of dedicated capacity in the presidency to focus on reducing red tape across government and improve the ease of doing business. In line with this priority, in this financial year, the DTIC introduced measures to reduce red tape in all its programs. The committee acknowledged the importance of this in improving the ease of doing business consequently attracting investment. One of the areas that the DTIC and the um, company's Intellectual Property Commission have done well in and contributed to the ease of doing business has been the reduction of company registration in just one day. The mechanisms that have already been put in place and now anyone can register a business in a day. To contribute to broad and inclusive economic development, the DTIC continues to revitalize old industrial parks in rural town and township areas by building infrastructure that will make those areas more attractive for investment. Investment into these areas will consequently lead to the creation of job opportunities. This is an important area of oversight for the committee. Recently, the committee visited the Ikandastria Industrial Park in Mpukmalanga, where it engaged with different companies operating in that park. Practical work is underway to revitalize industrial parks across the country. In Shesheku Industrial Park, 21.09 million was invested to revitalize the industrial park and consequently attracted an investment value worth 58.28 million.
The scope of the project comprises the renovation of 11 factories, the development of digital hubs, and the rehabilitation of stormwater channel. In conclusion, the committee supports the budget vote for the Department of, of Trade, Industry, and Competition, as it will be an enabler to inclusive economic growth and job creation, which is envisaged in the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan. The role of the state has become ever more relevant as we seek to put our economy on a sustainable growth tra trajectory that is inclusive of all South Africans. We seek to build a developmental state and the development of the state cannot be left to the whims of the market. The responsibility of government is to strategically think about how state-led investments can help to shape citizens' long-term prospects. We encourage the department to build forward better. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable McPherson. Thank you, House Chairperson. At every engagement or budget debate we have, Minister Patel's standard and somewhat predictable response to the DA is that we are grandstanding and being personal. He believes that pointing out the economic failures of government he serves in and economic policies that he champions is somehow an attack on his dignity or character. I want to assure him from the outset of this debate that today will be no different. Because the truth of the matter is that what he does or doesn't do is deeply personal for 60 million people in South Africa. The choices he makes, the battles he chooses, or the sides he takes is the difference between putting food on the table or entrenching poverty. And at time, it's the difference between life and death. It is the choice between entrenching state-sponsored anti-competitiveness and lowering costs for consumers. Sadly, Minister Patel, given the choice, will almost always pick the side which most harms our country and the people who live in it. Because being a trade unionist, his natural instinct is always to gravitate towards and align himself with the insiders and to do everything possible to shut out those on the outside. Take, for example, the debate about poultry prices and the effects that tariffs have on it. Millions of South Africans rely on poultry as the cheapest form of protein. However, over the last few years, prices have steadily increased because multi-billion rand JSE listed businesses have been given state-sponsored protection from imports. This was in reaction to the very same companies who were selling seawater for the price of chicken by brining products with up to 80% seawater. So they needed a miracle to save their businesses and found it in the form of tariffs championed by the DTI. While they have swelled their profits on the back of South Africans, ordinary people are required to pay more. The DA has warned the minister and the department this day was coming, yet they've not listened. They have hidden behind all sorts of excuses about protecting industry, but in truth, they don't care about working class South Africans. If the minister and his department really cared, they would immediately heed our call and drop all duties on imported chicken for at least six months to allow consumers to source the cheapest source of protein in the most trying of times. Minister, are you prepared to work with the DA to achieve this? And if not, you should tell us today why you don't believe South Africans should have access to cheap poultry to feed their families. Being the internationalist that you are, I'm sure that you will know that Mexico has done this with immediate effect. Minister, for far too long, ordinary South Africans have been locked out of being a part of the one trillion rand in government procurement each year because of triple B double E. It has become the ultimate system of ANC political patronage where value for money and social responsibility is not the main driver for delivery. Triple B double E is the enabler of, of a grand ripoff. And I think that government is finally waking up to this reality. And I know this to be true because the tender documents for the port operator of Durban Harbour and Kucha exclude triple BWE as a requirement for the first time. This is a major step and one which the DA fully supports. This new dawn in thinking by government 
has encouraged the DA to finalize our social impact bill, which will leverage state procurement to benefit communities through sustainable development goals and not through patronage and corruption. Ordinary South Africans, particularly low income black South Africans, will finally have the opportunity to benefit from government procurement, which will drive economic growth and create jobs. That's why the DA is encouraged by a letter from Kasatu that supports the DA's inclusion of SDGs as a form of redress through government procurement in our bill. Kasatu are halfway down the road to supporting this historic piece of legislation, and we thank them for that. Minister, the DA is personal with you about issues of the economy and your record in government because it is so personal for millions of people. In KZN, children are eating sand to keep hunger at bay. This is no accident either. It's a result of three decades of failed economic policy. You have been involved in this for 10 years or nearly a third of it. This is why we cannot be nice about these issues. There are no pleasantries to be passed around where nearly 200 children under the age of five have died of hunger in January and February alone. There are no handshakes and backslapping to be had when 40% of our country is unemployed. You and your ANC colleagues must account for these failures. Stop blaming everyone else and take bold decisions now. If you want the so-called grandstanding and personal attacks to stop, then put something on the table for us to support. You can, be, you can start by halting tariffs on chicken and food imports for six months and support our bill to end triple B double E. Let me finish off with a quote of my own by the progressive poet and author, Michael Bassey Johnson, when he said, you can believe in whatever you like, in whatsoever you like, but the truth remains the truth, no matter how sweet the lie may taste. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Chuaku. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. The EFF rejects the budget vote because the department's primary function is to create jobs and their annual plans are not, um, they are not the concrete plans to create jobs and grow the economy. And even their so-called master plan are not plans at all. The department is confused about its core function. It started by saying that the, that the IT strategic plan and annual performance plan is informed by countries' imperatives to address high levels of power, employment, poverty, and inequality, improve the economy, and ensure that every citizen in this country participate in the economy. Later in, this, in their own, you know, own document, it changes the tune, and it says job creation is not their core mandate. The South Africans must just forget that there will ever be anything tangible coming out from this department. Everything is in the planning phase. They have a series of task teams that continue to research the reports that they've compiled. Depart the, the, a, a department that still talks about a job opportunities, not jobs, you know, that are, are created, it must never be taken, you know, uh, um, seriously. The economic, you know, the, the economic policy the zigzag has led to the economy that is not growing, not creating jobs. White population continuing to own the, the economy. Poor quality of life and increased gap between the rich and the poor. It must be clear that no jobs will be created under the, the Department of Trade and Industry, as they contradicted themselves by saying that it is, it is outside their scope. It must be put on record that they are key performance indicators, are reports, conferences, appearances on TV, and nowhere it says that this year so many jobs will be created. The department has adopted neoliberal policies that cannot create jobs and, still, uh, and stimulate eco economic growth. The department is anti-state-led development, even though its president agreed with the economic freedom fighters that there needs to be a state-led development to stimulate economic growth. The delay in the finalizing of the special economic zone is another indication that the department is not interested in the creation of jobs. The department has allowed South Africa to be a dumping ground of low-grade manufactured goods. The international trade policies still allow goods that could be manufactured locally to be imported, for example, chickens. Mr. Ramaphosa held a series of investment conferences and called the so-called business, a uh, uh, big business, to pledge amounts that they indicated that they would invest. And they never did. There has been a jobs bloodbath. 
There is no clear understanding from the department that the private sector cares about making profits and will do everything to ensure that profits are maximized, even through exploitation of workers. We are still waiting for the report from the department as to how many jobs are created by the wasteful expenditure of the investment conference by Ramapos. And of those who pledged, how many invest, how many have invested in the economy of this country? South Africa is the most unequal society where the rich is getting richer and the poor is getting poorer. And there's no plan from the department to address this issue. 28 years down the line, the, so, the social architecture of white rule formed over three centuries has created the most unequal, unequal society in, in the world. The ANC has not wiped away the apartheid legacy. They have maintained the status quo with the white people owning 85%, with the 10% of the white population owning 85% of the wealth of, the, of this country. The department has failed to supply the portfolio committee with the list of industries that have been financed and operational under the, and, and the number of jobs that are created, you know, created. The financing entities such as the IDC and NEF are delaying in approving application of potential black industrialists because they are not politically correct or the IDC officials are not able to benefit from the deals. The department fails to support small-scale sugarcane farmers by acquiring milling, a simple milling machine. This could have been a massive assistance to them as they will stop relying on some old white farmers' milling machines, of which its usage favors the white sugar farmers. This indicates that the department lacks the understanding that through small-scale farming, massive jobs can be created. The entities such as the SABS are under administration. At the same time, there's an alleged corruption and maladministration at the state notaries. Slow acting by the department leaves much to be de 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 desired. It can be viewed as a, as, a, as a serious attempt to privatize the SAPS and other entities if it succeeds. It will be used to prevent black majority from owning industries. It must be put on record. Now, as long as the government does not own means of production, such as land and minerals, nationalize the bank to be able to finance the projects for general masses of our people, the economy of this country will remain in the hands of the whites and it will never grow. And again, if this government does not increase import tariffs to stimulate local manufacturing, goods will still be imported and no jobs will be created in South Africa. It will be created internationally. And again, if it does not support the small scale farmers, no massive jobs will be created at all. And also, if it does not finalize because it's playing hide and, and, and seek, in terms of finalization of the specialized economic zones with special tax incentives. These zones will not be attractive to build industries um, where people can, can start to, to actually create jobs. Now, the EFF vehemently rejects this budget vote because it lacks uh, substance. It doesn't show in whether you, uh, this department is serious in terms of the uh, you know the creation of, of, of the of, of the of these jobs, they keep on having what is called master plans after master plans. When I joined this committee, there are master plans and after master plans, and these master plans they have never been concluded. So with their researchers, with the so-called brilliant economists, it is not so. It's not even easy for them to say this economy is not growing. So let us look at a different economic policy, such as an a, an economy. That will be state-led. Thank you very much, uh, 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 my, my chairperson. Thank you, honorable member. The next speaker is the honorable Mwobo. Uh, thank you, uh, honorable chairperson. Um, the mandate of the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and its ability to give effect to its key priorities must be measured against the stark reality of South Africa's economy. With a staggering unemployment, uh, with a staggering unemployment of 35,3 percent, coupled with the devastating economic damage following the July 2021 riots, which cost South Africa an estimated 50 billion rand, little faith remains in government's ability to rebuild and rebrand South Africa. 
In the president's State of the Nation address, much emphasis was placed on, and I quote, and blocking specific obstacles to investment and business growth, unquote. And to simplify processes, to attract investment and trade. These words were, were greatly welcomed at the time of the speech. But again, these lofty promises mean little if we do not see clear government commitments and enforcements to this effect. On consideration of the department's latest annual performance plan and budget, it is concerning that although the department set out to reduce red tape across all its programs as per president's state of the national trust, no specific measures and practices were identified in the annual performance plan requiring action. This failure is critical and leaves little faith that the department has fully interrogated this commitment and identified obstacles in the programs which complicates and hence stifles investment opportunities. This failure, furthermore, hinders the Portfolio Committee from interrogating the performance of the Department of, of the Department and demanding accountability on behalf of the people. The failure to set out clear achievable outcomes in the annual performance plan is an aspect seen throughout the department's programs. The FP shares the Portfolio Committee's concern that the lack of qualification of outcomes is critical. Failure and cannot and should not be tolerated. It is vital that the public is provided with clear targets to measure the, the department's performance. The AFP furthermore agrees with the Portfolio Committee that the budgetary cuts of 1.79 billion rand to the industrial financing program of the department raises much to be concerned, much, much concern, and is in stark contrast to government's commitment to attract and retain investment. This program serves a vital function to stimulate economic activities by offering incentives in the form of grants, loans, and tax allowances to qualify enterprises. The Department of Special Economic Zones and Industrial Parks by the Department is a good initiative to develop local, regional, and rural economies. However, for this initiative to stand any chance, we need local government to be strong and functioning. These initiatives may be completely derailed by failing municipalities who are unable to guarantee consistent service delivery. We need to closely monitor this initiative as cooperation, pro uh, co proper coordination, and strong oversight is vital. The people of South Africa deserve a, com a committed accountable government that will steer economic policy with uh, clear targets, direction, and transparency. The department, as the custodian of the government's economic policy development, has a mammoth task ahead of ahead, and the IFP will closely interrogate its performance, and in the uh, coming financial year, the IFP accepts the budget vote. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is Honourable Mulder. Thank you, Honourable House Chair. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition has 16 entities. Of these, only three are self-funded. These are the companies and the Intellectual Property Commission, the NEF, and the National Lotteries Commission that has been stuttering under a scandal after the term of its former chairperson, Alfred Nebutanda, ended in November 2020. Commission Oude thuise is ook die bemachtiging van vrouwen in die jeug. Meer as 50 afzonderlijke zaken van corruptie en wanbestering word onderzoek en slechts 12 van die 50 zaken is tot dusver afgehandeld. Het is een voorde die proces om een nieuwe raad en voorzitter aan te wijzen in die komitee maar starig. 
The SABS, the South African Bureau of Standards, was placed under administration by the department in October 2018 and implemented a three-year turnaround strategy, but the financial state of the once proud institution deteriorated to the disadvantage of quality control in South Africa. Last year, the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition could be seen as the triple BE flagship of the government with race uh, issue driven by Black Industri Industrial Forum, the Triple B Commission, and a competition tribunal, amongst others. In August 2021, the Competition Commission prohibited a proposed takeover of Burger King in South Africa by an international private equity fund over the lack of historically disadvantaged persons amongst the new owners. The Competition Commission has therefore become yet another undemanded enforcement agency for black economic empowerment. The Honorable Minister Ibrahim Patel will remember that we debate on ANC government economic development policies quite often in the committee. The Department for Trade, Industry and Competition is probably the key driver to contribute towards economic growth and specifically economic recovery during the aftermath of state capture, corruption and the devastating effects that COVID-19 regulations had on the South African economy. But House Chair, the way that Triple B has manifested in South Africa resulted in the widening of the gap between rich and poor since 1994. In fact, amongst the highest in the world, despite the ruling party's mandate to redress inequality, the number of black business owners has decreased, with the result that Triple B only benefited a few. Triple B has already failed. ANC policies has created new inequalities, and by simply enforcing the very same policies, will most certainly result in the same enhancing legacy of poverty and destruction, of which, of course, will be remembered in the future as a legacy of the ANC government. And I will repeat this, the destruction and poverty will be talked of or thought of in the future as a legacy of the ANC government. Honorable House Chair, the report before the House states that over the strategic five-year period from 2020 to 2025, and for the 2021-22 financial year, the department's budget is focused on the implementation of policies, strategies, programs, and incentives aimed at promoting industrial development and broadening participation in the economy, but unfortunately, just more of the already failed policies. The purpose of the development of special economic zones as a way to promote inclusive economic transformation and to industrialize the economy through the development of special economic zones. Industrial parks and black industrialist program is already under threat because of the fact that ESCOM is in no position to provide electricity to support these initiatives. And as with the district municipality model, local government is failing South Africa and cannot supply the support as far as electricity, water, roads, etc., is concerned. Honorable Chair, South Africa need a total new relook and even a new dispensation as far as economic development and growth is concerned. Therefore, the Freedom Front Pass will not support this budget vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Free. Honorable House Chairperson, the ACDP acknowledges that this department budget has to be applied within a constrained international and domestic environment. The ACDP also notes that despite the mandate of moving South Africa to, towards a dynamic industrial and globally competitive economy, South Africa has one of the highest unemployment rates in the world, sitting at 35.3% and the expanded definition at 46.2%. Additionally, our Gini coefficient places us as one of the most unequal nations in the world. Simply stated, after 28 years of democracy under the ruling party, unemployment and poverty has increased to some of the highest levels ever. The ACDP notes the potential of the master plans as an intervention for industrialization and economic recovery. These, however, are not without their challenges. For example, the sugar industry. Cane production here is increasing, but mills 
are closing down. This is a recipe for disaster, particularly for our small cane uh, small cane growers. The ACGP calls for the scrapping of the health promotion levy or sugar tax as it is counterproductive in that your affected industries purchase less sugar and then use sugar alternatives to that are more harmful than the sugar itself. The ACGP has at times been the lone champion of the benef of beneficiation as a policy tool for economic and employment growth. The South Africa has some of the richest mineral deposits in the world, and we cannot in perpetuity export the majority of our raw materials only to import, import the finished product. By doing so, we create jobs outside of South Africa rather than internally, and we perpetuate the colonial dogma that Africans will remain consumers of goods rather than being producers and innovators. With that said, it would be remiss of me not to warn political parties and the people of South Africa about the World Health Organization governing body and the World Health Assembly meeting to be held in Geneva, Switzerland this weekend, where provisional agenda 16.2 will be discussed. If these amendments are agreed to, South Af by, by countries like South Africa included, it will grant the World Health Organization universal power to dictate their own policies on health care, obligating signatory nations to cede their national health care sovereignty to the World Health Organization. This body would then have decision-making authority to intervene in government policies of any nation in the world without our permission. And this is not about health, but a daring attempt at totalitarianism and global dominance under the Great Reset, where you will own nothing and be happy. All freedom-loving South Africans and Honorable citizens members, of the world must reject this. Failure inspired. to do so will make our DTC uh, eco economic growth interventions obsolete. I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Mwache. Thank you, Honorable House Chair, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister, Honorable Members, fellow South Africans. The ANC support the vote. The budget takes place in the midst of the continued threat of COVID-19 to the life roots of many people across the globe. Global uncertainty brought about by a conflict between economic power and essential threat of climate change uh, to the planet. The ANC-led government has shown resilience and determination in its quest to transform the lives of the South Africans under the difficult circumstances. The budget vote for the Department of Trade and Industrial Competition gives practical expression to the economic reconstruction and recovery plan will put our economy back on growth trajectory. The budget allocates $5 billion to the industrial financing program through the, this program, the DTI, See, support the implementation of the economic trans, uh, reconstruction and recovery plan and the reimagined industrial strategy by providing in incentives through the automotive incentive scheme, black industrialist program, agro processing support scheme, strategic partnership program, aquaculture development and enhancement program, and clothing and textiles company competitiveness program. Approximately 3.6 billion is allocated for transfer to the DTIC entities which support small and medium-sized businesses. The special development, uh, the special development program promotes inclusive economic transformation through in industrialization of the economy by developing and funding SAZ, industrial parks and the black industrialist program. This will be driven through the district development, development model. The focus will be on governance and arrangement through, through uh, strong commitment from all spheres of government. The development of strong and, and credible investment promotion and facilitation plans. Community involvement and facilitation hybrid ownership and feasible financial models. Special economic zones are essential drives of economic growth localization and structural transformation. We have seen the rapid growth of special economic zones such as Kuha, Duba, Duba Trade Port, East London. 
structurally automotive sector, which demonstrates the significant role played a pledge SEZ program in the country. This and other SEZs are showing great potential and attracting domestic and foreign investment to date. There, there were 10 special economic zones with an investment of 22 billion and to date, 19,000 jobs had been created from AC, SEZs. As part of the economic uh, reconstruction and recovery plan, the, SA, the SEZ will be an important element of reigniting manufacturing led industrialization in accelerated manner. The revival of industrial parks is essential in promoting decentralization of industrialization to the less economy activity laden areas such as township and semi-rural areas. The revitalization program is meant to improve industrial infrastructure, which has edged because of the exit of investors in the last few decades. Working with provincial government, investors are being sourced to settle in these parks and create jobs. Uh, honorable uh, Chapo, and also he runs the only black industrial gas company which supplies gases oxygen to Palavura Copper. The South African township economy is estimated to be about 100 billion. It is therefore essential that industrial park must also be catalyst for the township and the rural economy. This means that the parks must respond to how it plays a facilitation role to promote emerging township and rural enterprises. A lot need to be done to, ident to, to identify youth innovations and be nurtured in into sound business proportions. The place is an obligation on government through the development model to consistently roll out the programs in our community. Our economy is therefore founded on our SEZs and industrial park that parks their success is critically for sustained inclusive economic growth. In conclusion, uh, Honorable Speaker, I wish to conclude to, to quote the former General Secretary of the United States, Ben Key. Honorable member, there seems to be a difficulty with your connection, and you are no longer affordable. When he said, saving our plan, advancing economic growth, this dot between climate change, what are these we are on guest to grow our economy for the betterment of South Africans? We must equal ensure that we build res resistance and policies of the NC-led government are working towards this. We therefore believe that this budget vote entails exactly what our economy needs. The ANC support the budget vote. I thank you. Thank you, Honourable uh, Member. Honourable Members, the next speaker is the Honourable Deputy Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition, the Honourable Gina. Thank you very much, House Chair. Greetings to, to you, House Chair, Minister, Deputy Ministers that are here. Chairperson and the Portfolio Committee, Honourable Members, Federal South Africans. When we presented the budget vote last year, that is 2021, our key running theme was our economy resilience. At the time, we were on the second year of COVID-19 adjustment lockdowns, 
Having survived 2020 hard lockdown that saw our economy shutting down, whites globally confronted with massive supply chain disruptions. But the robustness of our economy base, our sophisticated financial institutions, and other advanced sectors of our economy demonstrated our resilience in the face of shocks and tailspins. The strength and stubbornness of our economy has been further demonstrated, not with, notwithstanding the massive joblessness it has brought uh, uh, and the weakening of corporate balance sheets by the survival and solid response to July unrest of last year, the current European war, and the recent coastal floods. House Chairperson, in underlining the above resilience, we are not over uh, simplifying the negative economic blows that we are receiving, nor our covering, or we are covering ourselves in glory. As a result of all the above challenges to the economy, we are confronted with a sustained weak growth, extreme fiscal pressures, deepening poverty, and a real threat of food shortages, and the advent of rising food prices because of Russia-Ukraine conflict. This has prompted a new thinking in us, including what Minister Patel alluded on with regards to the positioning of South Africa for multinationals regional hubs, which is going to be a new response to global supply chain risk proofing. Honorable members, if there is one thing that is urgent and mostly required in, in manifold from our side as government, it is to shoulder up this small yet sophisticated economy to grow stronger. It is building a capable state. A capable state plans extensively, coordinates, and also builds in its institution to outlive every political leadership elected in public offices. Such a state drives decisive developmental projects, even in risk areas that the private sector cannot dare going. Such a state where it mobilizes business in risk areas, it develops a mechanism to de-risk the private investment for the greater good of business and development objectives. But a capable state must enjoy partnership with business and drive trade and industrialization policy for growth. Such a state should be incorruptible with its institution staffed with sound technical know-how patriot and patriotism. Minister Patel has spoken extensively about our path on capable state and card on the district development model. House Chair, for some time, the DTIC has been implementing a special industrial development, that is SID. This has been driven by the designation of and the establishment of the special economic zones and industrial parks in various cities and regions across the country to build the regional economies. Uh, and we have seen this, it is, it is unfolding. But this approach has been limited to those metros and districts with the industrial parks legacy, legacy infrastructure, only for us to revitalize and attract investors. For SCZs, few regions had the had capacity to apply for designations, and this meant the rest of other districts, in the 44 of them, had no special industrial plan and development. The new approach seek to bog down all 44 districts and eight metros with provincial government anchored by DTIC to plan and coordinate industrial hubs of different shapes. However, we have since realized that this amount of work to succeed all three spheres of government must get involved. In that context, we seek to impose mechanisms of a capable state in the building of economy in all three spheres of government through this our new approach to play a role. District development model approach in the special economic development will see DTIC planning and putting resources per each district municipality with the provincial government also putting resources in economic hubs, economic zones, and industrial parks. District municipalities will play a pivotal role in driving the economic growth, which will be a new mandate to district. A task of job creation in the economy must be seen as a collective responsibility of all spheres of government. District municipal LEDs working with national government 
uh, economic cluster de uh, departments and provincial government involved in the economic development will now be entrenched in this approach that DTIC is bringing. At the center of, the, of catalyzing the industrial hubs, parks and spatial zones is the drive to fast track the level of localization as a fundamental policy of industrialization and resilient national economy that is self-sufficient and strong. Our excessive exposure to imports has exposed us during pandemic when global supply chains were disrupted. Honorable House Chair and honorable members, it is interesting to note that what started as a far-fetched dream from President Ramaphosa to launch an investment drive has already produced commitments of more than 95 of more than 95 percent targets despite COVID-19 fears. This achievement translates to 1.14 trillion of 1.2 trillion overall target by the president when he announced this initiative in 2018. Let me make one example. Recently, we have just opened an Ireland multinational ingredient company in Hammersdale in Devon, the Carroll Group, that invested 650 million to play a significant role in the food ingredient sector in the continent as a whole, creating more jobs directly and through SMMEs contracting. I think, again, House Chair, we need to share more with the honorable members so for them to know exactly as to say the commitments that were that were made in the investment the president and the presidential investment conference we see the fruits the, the the commitments are adhered to and we see those investors coming to our country it's one area where we must be open so that honorable members can be aware of this and not criticize from the 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 the, 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 the unknowing background one of the key pillars of re and reindustrialization is the building of economic social compacts. With the experience of the automotive, sugar, clothing, textile, leather, and shoe moves master plan, steel and furniture master plan, we can deduce that there is no stakeholder in all economic sectors that is not committed to the reindustrialization agenda. The, tri uh, the tripartite engagement between government, business, and organized labor often gets intense on the terms of the ultimate of the plan and how to reach there in terms of targets. But ultimately, all parties emerge as committed to the implementation. White's COVID environment created some slow pace in steaming ahead in implementation of some of the targets, as for an example, in the automotive sector. But the sugarcane sector is already implementing its elements, working with stakeholders and the partners. Let me make some few examples of the achievements that we have seen through our master plans to prove that it's not just a plan, but it's the working plan. It's the plan where we plan, we implement, while we're still in discussion, discussions with all the role players within the sector. In the steel master plan, the DTIC has supported 11 projects in the value chain, resulting in the disbursement of the, to the value of 209 million, 1.3 billion investments, leveraged and 2.439 jobs supported. We are not just planning, but we are implementing. In the Pottery Master Plan, 10 black, 10 black contract growers have been established, leveraging investment of 336 million with 122 new jobs created. In the Sugar Master Plan, ShopRite is partnering with the South African sugarcane growers to promote the sale of locally produced sugar in its 1.189 stores. And there's so many discussions that we are, we are with when it comes to the sugar master plan. Right now, we know exactly, even when we have listened to the Minister of uh, Agriculture, we are together in making sure that when it comes to this master plan, our black growth, um, the, the, the black growers do benefit, and it's what we are engaging with as the Department of Trade, Industry, and Competitions too. In the Autos Master Plan, the Automotive Industry Transformation Fund is supporting six companies with funding of 82 million, but more importantly, access to orders of 1.8 billion. We are generally encouraged by the collegiality and commitment of all sectors that have achieved in the signing of these master plans. We see no retreat and backhand auto maneuvering by all the stakeholders. Jefferson, 
Uh, one other thing I would love to touch on the African Free Continental Trade Area approvals. Oh, Deputy Minister, your time has expired. Thank oh. you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you so Thank much. You. The next speaker is the Honorable Malamache. Thank you, House Chairperson, Honorable Ministers, Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, fellow South Africans. As African National Congress, we support the budget vote number 39. It is of great honor and privilege to be service of the people of South Africa. Let me start by quoting Amelka Cabra when he said, open quote, always bear in mind that the people are not fighting for ideas, for things in anyone's head. They are fighting to win material benefit, to live better, in peace, see their lives go forward, to guarantee the future of their children. It is along this line that the ANC has been given a mandate by the people of South Africa to defeat unemployment, poverty, and inequality. They trusted us structurally to transform our economy, to go away with over concentration of our economy, ensure their participation in the life of economy. Apartheid has left country with an economy characterized by at least level of concentration of ownership and control, as well as the lack of participation by all South Africans. The apartheid regime actively promoted national champion in different sectors through the development of industrial state-owned enterprise monopolies and agricultural cooperative that was later privatized. The regime also condoned industrial cartels in their efforts to promote the interest of a minority. The ANC-led government is hard at work to challenge all of these and ensure that the vast majority of South Africans do not remain area in the land of their forefathers. The economic recovery plan places considerable emphasis on reindustrialization, export promotion in key local areas. The primary means through which this will occur is through sectoral master plan. In support of this, the Competition Commission has activated its exemption provision for the steel, sugar, agriculture, and manufacturing sectors. This will enable deeper cooperation amongst FIM to support localization and export promotion with small businesses and FIM owned by the previously disadvantageous person. This will be instrumental in decentralizing our economy, making it more inclusive as the evidence has shown that the high level of concentration of high of ownership in many sectors of our economy are inimical to growth, the entry of the Black South African into economy, effective growth. Inclusive growth must mean that Black people are no longer relegated to being laborers forever. Inclusive growth, it is to have a real meaning in South Africa, must embrace the need to increase the participation of Black people, women, youth, in all aspects of business, including as shareholders, managers, entrepreneurs. The increased budget of 87 million to the competition commission will ensure that the commission is sufficiently empowered to work towards ensuring that we have a growing, decentralized, and inclusive economy. The recent research by the competition committee has found that economic remain concentrated 15 years since the act was promulgated. As a result of continued high level of concentration, the Competition Amendment Act was promulgated in 2019 with a specific aim of adequately equipping the Commission to address two persistent structural constraints in the South African economy, namely the high level of economic concentration in the economy and the skewed ownership profile of economy. If we do not deal with these structural and systematic constraints, we will not be able to transform the economy. Greater competition foster greater efficiency, innovation from film, and in so doing, reduce prices to the benefit of other films in economy delivered by the state, purchasing products, services, and consumers. A more competitive economy results in higher growth, job creation by enhancing the ability of domestic film to replace import, expand export, greater innovation also creating new opportunity for businesses. The Competition Act further seek to also ensure that such growth is more inclusive, addressing past inclusive through actively promoting transformation and SME participation as a public interest objective in its enforcement action. 
The work of the commission through its market inquiry sought to protect the South African public from the wrath of Antalopia's conglomerates. The data inquiry found that the data prices were excessively high and anti-poor. A settlement agreement was reached with the network provider to reduce data cost by 35 to 50% to offer extensive zero rate of educational and government website along with some daily free data. This has ensured that the poor are not left behind considering the digital area we live in. The commission also worked tirelessly to monitor the prices of food in the market on a quarterly basis. This meant to protect ordinary South Africans from the unjust Googling price by the same Google merits, reducing barriers to entry and increasing the participation of small business, important contributing to dynamics and transformation of ownership in the economy. Small businesses are the greatest creators of employment and the support provided by the commission in protecting small business in this regard is necessary and critically for our transformation. But to perhaps let's see this story, Burabotan, 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 Read the African National Congress. We believe that the budgets will further empower and strengthen the important role that the competition commission, the competition commission is in it and ensures that we seek to improve the life and the living conditions of our masses. We therefore want to take this opportunity to further say, Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Thank you, Honorable Member. The next speaker is the Honorable Hendricks. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable House Chair. Honorable House Chair, does the Department of Trade and Industry take the vision and mission of President Rabaposa seriously? We have just heard the criticism now about data. Nothing is being done by trade and industries with regard to ensuring that South Africans, especially those in poor areas, don't have access but have a right to one kilo gig of data. So al does not think that the Department of Trade and Industry take uh, anything seriously which the President says with the nation. We haven't heard uh, a, a, a response uh, to the outside business opportunities the president alluded to. This is the responsibility of many departments, including trade and industries. While it is acknowledged that Africa has a conspicuous presence and a firm foothold in the African Union and BRICS, uh, can we proudly say that South Africa is playing a meaningful role in its own interest and that of the continent? I don't think so. Can we argue that in the African Union, South Africa has contributed substantially, and if so, then how have South Africans gained from members factoring in the socio-economic woes that the country encounters? <laughs> Since South Africa became a member of BRICS, have we gained a win-win scenario, bearing in mind that we hold the smallest position financially? We even allow them uh, with the mega projects uh, to engage in forced removals and to demolish homes. The export marketing assistance scheme must be transparent on how the poor sector of our population benefit from the scheme and the support for the businesses adversely affected by the riots in July last year. The South African Pavilion Project that organizes exhibits in Dubai and other countries should play a more inclusive role for marginalized communities to benefit economically from such exhibitions. It is in, indeed good to note that South Africa has access to large economic markets such as North America, Western Europe, or the EU. But what efforts has South Africa made to retain the interest of the smaller markets where innovation and growth also take place with smaller risks? We are going to hear the Prince and the Minister talk and I hope they can address uh, some of these issues. The department support for dynamic companies that weave in economic inclusion. To what extent is this exclude inclusion of the marginalized communities? The marginalized communities should be included. 
This Department of Trade and Industries has a record of being in bed with big business. I hope the Prince and the Minister can respond to Parliament and tell us that they are not in bed with big business. Thank you very much, Honourable House Chair. Thank you, Honourable Hendricks. The next speaker is the Honourable Cuthbert. Honourable House Chairperson, cognitively dissonant towards the long-term consequences of government-led import substitution, Minister Patel has forged ahead with these plans to localise up to 20% of all non-petroleum goods. There's a certain emotive appeal to local is lacquer that resonates with South Africans who find themselves out of work, living in poverty, and looking for a convenient scapegoat upon which to lay the blame. The reality is that localized goods for which there is no specialization will soon start to decline in terms of quality and increase in price due to diminished competition and a lack of international market access. Ultimately, economic growth starts to slow as other countries put in place retaliatory measures and workers who rely on the export of goods lose their jobs. This policy is being pursued in the context of rising cooking oil, fertilizer, transport, and wheat prices as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Coupled with inflation gathering pace towards the outer limit of the targeting ban, and we find ourselves in a full-blown cost of living crisis. As much as the governing party likes to virtue signal about fighting inequality, poverty, and unemployment, this comes across as inauthentic. The fact is that they are the cause of the very challenges they claim to be fighting. Virtue signaler in chief Minister Ibrahim Patel will talk about how he envisions an inclusive and transformed economy. But what he fails to admit is that he protects special interests at all costs. Under the auspices of localization, we have also seen industrial policy become more vertical with the creation of industry master plans and working groups that get to pick the winners and losers in a given economic sector. His latest localization, Hobby Horse, being the total ban on the export of scrap metal. It is difficult to accept that he's acting in good faith on this issue considering his track record, and therefore it is naive not to question his bona fides. There is no doubt that the industrial scale theft of vandalism of our public infrastructure is an issue that needs to urgently be addressed. This was confirmed in a joint statement released in July 2021 by Telcom, ESCOM, Prasa and Transit, which said that both cable theft and infrastructure vandalism contributed to a direct loss of 7 billion rand and 187 billion rand knock-on effect on the economy per year. In particular, the scourge has crippled our export economy, local government service delivery and public transportation. However, a blunt instrument is not the cure, even though Ministers Gordon and Mbalula would have you believe so. As the editorial in last week's Business Day remarked, it would be a mistake to apply such a heavy-handed approach as it would punish legitimate dealers and the ban could create a thriving black market. The unintended consequences of the ban on the sale of alcohol and cigarettes in 2020 should be a cautionary tale for policymakers. It concludes by saying, SA has a crime problem rather than a trade policy problem. On this score, the DA agrees. It is as a result of this government's failure to enforce the law that we find ourselves in the situation that we do. This is why we have put forward a series of local, provincial and national interventions that we we'll believe will go away in addressing this crisis. For the purposes of this speech, I will share the national interventions which we have proposed to you and your colleagues in the Cabinet. Proper implementation of the Secondhand Goods Law of 2009, giving copper theft its own crime code and making the theft of it a priority crime at the SAPS, creating a specialised SAPS unit, setting copper theft reduction targets at parastatals, close cooperation between law enforcement and metal recyclers to assist in the tracking of illicitly traded metals, empowering the Non-Ferrous Theft Combating Committee through legislation and its own dedicated budget, establishing a reward hotline, eradicating the backlog of scrap dealer licenses, multi-agency cooperation and information sharing, and standardized transaction recording sale of scrap metal sales. The onus is on you, Minister, to cost these interventions that fall within the purview of your department and investigate how best to include them in your budget. Despite our party's respective clear policy differences, I'm sure that we can both agree that if we fail to safeguard our country's infrastructure, then we fail to protect our economy. I thank you, Honourable House Chair. Thank you, Honourable Member. The next speaker is the Honourable Prince Ernst Mamashe. The Honourable 
House Chair, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, Fellow South Africans. The ANC supports the budget vote 39. The ANC strategy and tactics highlights to us the relationship between the state and private capital, and it reads, the relationship between the national democratic state and all private capital, including monopoly capital, is one of unity and struggle, cooperation and contestation, close quote. As indicated by President Cyril Ramaphosa, at the State of the Nation address, the private sector has a cooperative role to play with the public sector to transform our economy and create the necessary jobs for the vast majority of unemployed of unemployed South Africans. Far from the deliberate mischievous misrepresentation of the trust of his accession, what we do know is that the representatives of white capital in parliament will never run out of spurious and nefarious negative things to say about the public sector. The Department of Trade, Industry and Competition will forever be their target because its mandate seeks to strengthen our resilience as an inclusive economy, unsettle and dismantle the historical conglomerates of oligopolistic oligarchs institutionalized by colonial and apartheid establishment, so as to transform the face of our industries to be more representative of the demographics of our country. Their wish is to relegate Black Africans to the slaves of white capital who remain deprived of access to economic opportunities and ownership of strategic assets, which are means of production. According to them, black people are not worthy of being black industrialists, being captains of industry, and producing their own goods and finished products. This is why they are against the industrialization and localization efforts of our government. We also have amongst us uh, populist demagogues who masquerade as revolutionaries in red overalls. But in all honesty, we know them to be wolves in Louis Vuitton and Goose Ship Cloak, who are also in bed with white capital and are beneficiaries thereof. <laughs> The introduction of sector master plans is predicated on the reimagined industrial strategy, which is laying out the plan for achieving greater, greener, and more inclusive growth with more jobs and is meant to resuscitate our industrial and manufacturing capabilities. Our sector master plans will help us achieve in bringing together the role of government with other social partners as the economic recovery and Reconstruction plan puts it, we are determined not merely to return our economy to where it was before the coronavirus outbreak, but to forge a new economy in a new global reality. At the center of forging this new economy is the intricate role that the state has to play in public investment schemes. And there are people who are direct beneficiaries of this, who without the support of the government, and our black empowerment policies would otherwise never have had the opportunity to participate in the life of our economy. Thus, the Black Economic Empowerment Policy Compendium is a strategic imperative we are neither ashamed nor apologetic to implement. That is why we applaud people like Beverly Mshaban, who lives in Pinoni. She is a poultry farmer empowered by the Poultry Master Plan. She has 6,500 hands for her egg laying business, which is expanding now into broiler production. An amount of 1.79 billion is allocated to the industrial policy, which supports the development and implementation of policies that facilitate diversifying the manufacturing sector and promoting local production. Many more previously disadvantaged people will be empowered through this program. In addition, the Industrial Development Corporation, through its funding vehicles, will continue to support businesses that produce locally. In the 2022-23 financial year, the IGC 
aims to facilitate localization worth 7.5 billion. The IJC has funded and is providing support to people like Maishela Maloka and Kate Machab, who are running an asphalt company where they manufacture hot mix, alphat, and does placement of different surface cells with an on-site logistic offering. They have thus far created 30 jobs. The, the firm boasts one of the few technologically advanced and fully automated plants in the country. Without the support of government and black em economic empowerment policies, these young people may never have had this opportunity. The state can never be left to be a spectator in the economy, as the reality of the matter is that free markets themselves are products of state intervention. In other words, markets are not freestanding realms in which states can intervene for good or ill, but rather they are outcomes of public as well as private action. Therefore, the logic that the state should not intervene in the economy is without merit and not scientific, as some amongst us want us to believe. Honorable House Chair, South Africa is part of the continent. Trade facilitation through the African continental free trade area will be instrumental in opening up markets and creating value chains in the continent. This will be highly beneficial for our black industrialists and presents an opportunity for industry and for new industrial enterprises and apprentices to build sustainable businesses. It will further be instrumental in building resilience for the continent, reducing the reliance from the powerful global forces. There are already few South Africans who are expanding their business throughout the continent. In Sekiliela, who sells wine to Ghana, Tame Goa, who exports cooler boxes to Mozambique, and Doran Barnes, who sells steel to the DRC. Oh, Bububunina, Oguna, Bagumze, Lawabandu, Bagukwe, to Gulizwekazi, Abain Alenye, Yokupila Gulo, Benga Yomikakwe, Betobe, and Abishonepa imitato Yokwebu, Nendengi Selwa. In this regard, we are steadfastly determined to create new industries. Work is underway to create opportunities for farmers in the hemp and cannabis industries, which has the potential to create in excess of 130,000 jobs for unemployed South Africans in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal. With the opening up of markets through the AFCFTA, the future can only be limitlessly bright for the industry. The department, together with the Department of Agriculture, is working on a legal framework to ensure that South Africans benefit fully from this. Yet again, the role and, in, and investment of the state will be critical in growing in the private sector to create these anticipated job opportunities. Abandu Bepondo Lempu Makapa Nekwazulu Natal, Inene Asifikanga Sikaleleki. Sizimisele uteta tetana, nabandu anabegazi, ikumgani ne ngosi, wanulundu chigelele, kutalwe amatuba, ngoku veliswa kwenza. In conclusion, House Chair, serving our people is the greatest honor that can be bestowed upon anyone. The African National Congress has changed the lives of many people and continues to do so. Yes, it is not enough. A lot more needs to be done. As Karl Marx said, if we have chosen the position in life which we can most of all work for humankind, no burdens can bow us down because they are sacrifices for the benefit of all. Then we shall experience no petty, limited, selfish joy, but our happiness will belong to millions. Our deeds will live on quietly and our ashes, over our ashes, will be shed the hot tears of a noble people. Let me, uh, as a parting shot, uh, House Chair, respond to the issue of Russia or Ukraine. The anti-communist, anti 
the Russian and anti Chuban deep seated hatred by the fascist DA will not deter peace loving real South African Democrats to appreciate the role of Russia and Cuba in our struggle for hard end freedom and liberation. We are not oblivious and amnesiac to your historical role, to your historical role against the cause of our liberation. Hence, your hysterical, nostalgic psychosis about Russia and Cuba. Ufuneka, sinisangu uleku zabata nezichinjelo zobu ngondo kuecha nisambulu uke kwi ngakaka yentiyo nenzondo. Makume tosi bele. Thank you, Honourable Member. I now invite the Honourable Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition to respond to the debate. The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, House Chair, and thank you to uh, the uh, uh, various parties for their contributions. I, in particular, have taken note of some important comments by Honourable Hermans, Honourable uh, Matze, uh, Honourable Malimetsa, Honourable Ngobo, uh, Honourable Burns Namashe, Honourable Tring, and Honourable Hendricks that pointed to specific areas that we will be following up. And uh, the, the work of the department is always enriched out of a debate in parliament. What the debate has confirmed, it's confirmed that there are two narratives in South Africa. Uh, first is the narrative of the DA and the EFF, filled with doom and gloom, unable to see what South Africans are doing, what, form, uh, what firms and small business in partnership with government is doing in very difficult circumstances to create jobs, to help to grow the economy, to feed the nation. The second narrative is a more balanced one that recognizes our challenges and our hardships, but also tell the inspiring stories of South Africa. Uh, let's take as an example uh, a, a few of the issues that have come up. I, I'm going to, to, to highlight um, in my response that the debate has demonstrated the inconsistencies and the extremism of some of the approaches and views. Let's take poultry as an example. It's an area that uh, has been raised by uh, uh, two speakers here, two honorable members. Uh, and um, I think what the poultry example demonstrates are a number of contradictions in the views of some members of the opposition. It's the DA versus the EFF is the first contradiction. So Honorable McPherson versus Honorable uh, Chwaku. So on the one hand, the DA says, you have got your tariffs too high. Just abolish them, make them zero. On the other hand, the EFF says, you have your tariffs too low, just raise them up so that nothing can be imported at all. It seems to me that the ANC-led government's approach is a more balanced approach, it's a more mature position that avoids these two extremes. What we've done is we've looked case by case at the evidence before us. Based on that evidence, we've been able to uh, ensure that there's sufficient protection for, uh, for South African producers, for people who create jobs here. At the same time, we've got to keep pressure on the poultry industry, the domestic poultry industry, to ensure that South Africans have access to affordable pricing, that our people are able to afford uh, the, uh, the, the protein that comes from that industry. And it's an important one. Now, of course, globally, uh, poultry prices have been rising. We've seen uh, food pr uh, price inflation going up across the world. I can regale Honorable McPherson on all the, uh, the results here on your food price inflation, 13.5% uh, for Brazil, almost 10% for the United States. 8.6% uh, uh, for the European Union. I can also take you through what has happened to poultry prices uh, in different countries in the world, if facts matter as we believe they should matter. If you take as an example, the year-on-year -year growth in poultry prices, globally by April 2022, it was 19%. That had nothing to do with South African policymaking. It had to do with a surge in, in uh, prices of foods across the world caused by supply chain disruptions, caused by geopolitical tensions and the war in Europe, caused by a number of factors. 
And what we're trying to do is to build the domestic uh, poultry industry that can supply food to South Africans and ensure that um, uh, South Africans have access uh, to, uh, to livelihoods too. And that brings me to another contradiction. It's the a contradiction of the Honorable McPherson versus the Honorable McPherson. It's the DA versus the DA. On the one hand, Honorable McPherson says, just cut these uh, tariffs, just remove them. The fact that um, 50,000 jobs in uh, poultry farming, in the manufacture of poultry feed and all the associated uh, uh, industries would be affected uh, is just conveniently forgotten. But in that same speech, Honorable McPherson then comes uh, back and says, create more jobs, there's 40% unemployment, you've got to do more on jobs. Honorable McPherson, one has got to be able to have internal consistency in one's position. You can't argue on the one hand, honorable member, that uh, we should take a set of policies that will destroy local jobs, and on the other hand, bemoan the fact that uh, there is high unemployment. South Africans need affordable poultry. South Africans need jobs. And government is trying to find ways in which we can balance these uh, important, uh, both are important objectives. And that's what we're doing uh, in our work. Honorable McPherson gives us a, an interesting uh, challenge, a challenge that I want, to, I want to, uh, to accept. He says, why don't you give us something that we can support uh, as the DA? Why doesn't government or the ANC-led government put something on the table? Well, let, let, me, let me take uh, a cracker at uh, Honorable McPherson because it's a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good thing that you've raised. Let me give the auto industry as an example and say, why don't you support our efforts there? In the last 12 months, just since the last budget speech, Mercedes-Benz has started to produce the new C-Class vehicle in Buffalo City, one of only three locations in the world that makes this vehicle. The others being Beijing in China and Bremen in Germany. Uh, Toyota in Etiquini launched its locally made Corolla Cross hybrid vehicle, bringing locally made lower emission vehicles to our roads. And Isuzu produced its new D-Max Bucky in Tebeja that farmers can use to take their products to market. Why don't you support that, Honorable McPherson? It creates jobs. It provides opportunities for South Africans. It localizes what we need to localize. Well, let me take another example. Let me take Tswani. In Tswani, we financed the building of a new special economic zone that this past year has seen three new factories already uh, in operation. Two years ago, it was an open felt. A year ago, it was just yellow metal uh, uh, trucks and, and dust and, and, and uh, mud all over as construction took place. Today, you go there and you see factories that are actually producing uh, components. And by, the, uh, by October this year, we expect a further eight factories to have opened. That's 2,000 real jobs, Honorable McPherson, jobs that South Africans need. Why don't you support that? Uh, we've had private investment of 4.3 billion rand that is committed by these contractors uh, and factory owners in the special economic zones. And uh, we've invested money in bulk infrastructure and top structures uh, with 45% uh, of that infrastructure budget spent on small and medium enterprises. Why don't you support that, uh, Honorable McPherson? But hang on. The DA leader, Honorable uh, John Steenhuisen, has already tried to claim credit for the Tswani SEZ. Last year in a photo opportunity in the run-up to the local government election. So the DA says, well, here's a great thing. At the same time, the, the DA has to recognize, because the facts speak for themselves, that the DTIC budget has helped to make that possible, has put the money there, that our meeting with Ford has brought that production to South Africa, has made it possible indeed for South Africa to, uh, to, to, to manufacture components using the labor of young South Africans, uh, people in Gauteng that are able to produce those goods. So there we have it then, uh, Honorable McPherson, just to take some small examples. Let me give other examples. Why don't you back us uh, and the work that the DTIC has done uh, to, to ensure that we have the industrial capability to produce COVID products here in South Africa? Let me take the example. 
of vaccines is one cl uh, clear example. Uh, we now have by October, November this year, we will have the, the uh, BioVac factory that the IDC has supported, uh, that, that factory that in fact government has some equity in, they will be producing the Pfizer vaccine. In uh, Trebecha, uh, the JNJ vaccine has been produced by a South African company called Aspen Pharmacare. Uh, and the factory that they're using was supported by the incentive schemes that the DTIC has administered. We've worked with Patrick Shung Shong, a South African American who has announced that he wants to open up the Nant SA factory in South Africa. We've worked with AfriGen, who has reverse engineered the mRNA vaccine uh, technology, and they now will have clinical trials early next year. We've been able to produce outside of vaccines, Honorable McPherson, uh, the CPAP ventilators, 20,000 of them that have been used largely in public hospitals. But the other day I was in a meeting with the CEO of a private hospital, and he he um, he congratulated government for that effort. He said they too had to use it when they ran out of uh, of stocks in their own hospitals. Why don't you support us in this? Uh, the fact that the first anesthetic plant on the African continent is open. Uh, you you ask for things that we can put on the table that you can support. I've put just a small sprinkling of things on the table. I hope you will be able to support us now. Honorable Tring, I look forward to your support for the DTIC budget. You raise an important issue around beneficiation. And I'm happy to say that we provided uh, detailed information recently at the mining in Daba of things that we're doing on beneficiation. Take, for example, that South Africa's first fuel cell factory started production in the Dube trade port using South African PGM uh, minerals. A greater proportion of our local scrap metal has been used in our, our foundries. Further beneficiation actions include a vanadium electrolyte manufacturing plant in the East London IDZ using South African mined vanadium oxide to create energy storage solutions and a nickel sulfate facility in Northwest using the byproducts of the PGM mining process to create components for lithium batteries used in electric vehicles. Well, let's look at the IDC, which is a key strategic partner to Bushfell Minerals, which is leading in the development of the domestic vanadium value chain, essential for grid scale renewable energy storage facilities. Or well, look at the support we're now giving to Lonix and Takadu battery mineral, um, a battery material investment, which produce high purity battle, uh, battery grade nickel sulfate, or the support for Gilgamesh that entails the processing of cobalt, nickel, and copper that's earmarked for the e uh, electric vehicle and energy storage markets. And I can give many examples in the steel uh, uh, industry, the South African Steel Mills pro Project, the score metals one, the support the IDC has given to the aluminium value chain and to via aluminium. What these illustrate is taking a vision and implementing it in very concrete and practical ways. Honorable Swaku, you raise the issue of support for small-scale sugar farmers, and you say, where is the support? I encourage you, visit small-scale uh, sugar farmers, and you will see examples there. You'll see that last year, just over 200 million rand of tangible support was given as a result of the sugar master plan to small-scale farmers. You would have seen the report that we tabled at the Portfolio Committee of Trade and Industry at which the South Africa Farmers Development Association, which is the body for small-scale farmers, have indicated in the writing in a press release that they published on the 29th of January this year, their strong support, their appreciation, and their congratulation to government for the efforts that government has taken uh, to support small-scale farmers. I can add to that also the work we've done with retailers to ensure that they buy from small-scale farmers, the work with Coca-Cola to ensure that it too uh, uses sugar produced by small-scale farmers. And these are some of many examples and so, really, Honorable Hendricks made an important point that we must get more value from our trade agreements. We agree. We now have a whole set of very concrete actions in our annual performance plan, Honorable Hendricks, that you'd be delighted to know, and I'm happy to, uh, to provide more information. Honorable Cuthbert, I like what you said that local is liquor. And you're right that we must ensure that our quality and our price don't disadvantage South Africans and that we, in fact, 
uh, work together to improve the dynamism and the strength of local industry. Because when we buy locally, when we support these programs, we create jobs for South Africans. At 40% of South Africans that need jobs, that are unemployed, they're not going to get jobs out of the air. It's out of us building those kind of capabilities. And I hope you'd be able to support us on this. You'll also find that many of the work that we're doing on scrap metal uh, is helpful. And some of those you may well see that we've done work on the areas that you've indicated, but you'll see we've gone even beyond that. Let me, let me begin to wrap up by saying there's lots that we've done, and I wish with these things, uh, honorable members, that there was more time that we can point to the many other excellent examples of work done by the DTIC and its entities building South African capacity. We've just brought together 50 black exporters in areas like food, engineering, auto components, beauty products, getting them to work together to unlock opportunities elsewhere in the world. We've just had a successful investment conference where we've had 300, uh, more than 300 billion rand committed. And over the last number of years, it's, uh, it's ensured more than 167,000 jobs that have been unlocked uh, in just the support of the industry. Your time has now expired. So let me conclude by thanking all honorable members for the support. Thank you very much. I think what this illustrates is we have a plan, we have concrete actions, and I look forward to the support of all members of parliament as we take this journey to create jobs and promote industrial development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honourable Minister. Honourable Members, that concludes the debate and the business of this mini plenary session. The mini plenary will now rise. Thank you. Long live the chairperson. Long live the chair. Long live the chair. Thank you, Chair. Long, long live the chair.